So Neisseria meningitidis is a gram-negative bacteria that is aerobic and facultative anaerobic and has a number of serogroups that can cause meningitis or meningococcal disease. It typically affects young children and young adults and is typically most fatal in very young children. It also targets patients with deficiencies in their complement uh, defense immune system and we'll talk about that in our patho pathology series in a bit more detail. In terms of culturing and isolating the bacteria there are selective and non-selective media used to grow the actual bacteria from a specimen. So one can use a non-selective media such as chocolate agar to grow Neisseria meningitidis or a more selective media such as Thayer Martin uh, agar and this has a number of antibiotics such as vancomycin, nystatin which typically inhibit the growth of other competing bacteria such as gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria but allow you to grow meningococcus. There are a number of risk factors for getting Neisseria meningitidis infection. Typically it occurs in patients who are colonized in their nasal pharynx with the bacteria it's seen in young children, young adults, those with complement deficiencies, um, those with other immunodeficiencies, such as patients who lack a spleen, who may have had sickle cell disease, who may be on steroids or are immunocompromised. And it's also seen classically amongst military recruits. Typically, the disease spreads from either the colonizing site or a contiguous infective site uh, via the bloodstream to the brain. So a patient may have an upper respiratory tract infection, they may have pneumonia, sinusitis, or an ear infection, and subsequent to spreading from that site, they may develop meningitis uh, by spread of this bacteria. Meningitis can have a very high mortality rate or fatality rate, ranging from up to uh, 25% down to 15% in typical individuals. And this tends to be higher again in those who are immunocompromised. Patients will present with classic features and these will be presented to you on your vignette um, reliably. So patients will report a headache, they'll report that they have issues with fever, rigors, neck stiffness, um, they may be vomiting, they may be intolerant of light when they look at it and so have photophobia and they may be confused or have altered mental status as well. One may see a rash which doesn't blanch, so a purpuric rash that doesn't blanch in the first few days of the illness, and seizures may develop as well in individuals. In infants, the symptoms are obviously a little less specific, so the patient, or rather the infant, may be um, not feeding well, they may be um, irritable, they may have a low temperature, and on examination, they may have focal neurological signs or a bulging fontanelle. And that might indicate the actual infant has developed meningitis. So there are two nonspecific signs of meningism that they may ask you about also. One is Koenig sign and the other is Brzezinski sign. Koenig sign refers to painful extension of the knee. And this is um, examined when you have the patient lying flat you flex their hip to about 90 degrees and then you extend their knee. And because of the inflamed meninges, extending the knee uh, stretches these. And you might notice that the patient may describe pain upon extending the knee or resist you extending the knee fully. Brudzinski sign appears when there is involuntary lifting of the legs when you ask the patient to raise their head off the actual examination table. So the patient is lying flat as if they were lying at home in bed and you ask them to raise their head upwards off the actual pillow and they will respond by raising their legs off the bed in order to take the pressure off the meninges. So sometimes they'll get you to use a CSF analysis or a cerebrospinal fluid analysis and figure out which one would be most likely associated with Neisseria meningitis or a bacterial meningitis. So it's really testing, do you know what a normal CSF analysis looks like? And what do bacterial, viral or TB um, samples appear like in terms of the lab findings? 
So looking at normal cerebrospinal fluid, it tends to be colorless. Um, when you look at it, you generally assess the opening pressure, how many white cells are in the fluid, how much glucose compared to your plasma glucose is present, how much protein is present, and whether or not there are organisms present as well. So normal CSF fluid is colorless. The opening pressure tends to be between 10 to 20 centimeters of water. There are little or no white cells. Um, the glucose level is between 60 and 80% of your plasma glucose reading, which you'll take at the time of the lumbar puncture. And the protein level tends to be around 0.2 to 0.4 grams per liter. With bacterial meningitis, the opening pressure can be raised. So you may see an opening pressure greater than 20 centimeters of water. When you look at the fluid, it may be cloudy. And generally what you'll see is you'll have a high white cell count, which will be mostly neutrophils. And you may see the organisms in the fluid when you culture it. The glucose level will be less than 50% of your blood glucose level and there'll be raised protein in the fluid as well. In viral meningitis, once again, you may see a raised opening pressure, but compared to bacterial meningitis, the actual fluid will look clear. The cell count will be raised, but this time it's mostly lymphocytes, whereas in a bacterial cause, it tends to be neutrophils. The glucose level tends to be normal, and the protein count can be normal or raised. With TB meningitis, the fluid may be clear or look a bit cloudy, and again, the opening pressure may be normal or raised. You may have a raised white cell count, and it typically is lymphocytes. Compared to a viral meningitis, the actual sugar count or sugar level in the CSF analysis is low compared to the plasma level and you tend to see a higher protein than you would see in a bacterial meningitis. Also in the history, the patient may have risk factors or a history of symptoms consistent with tuberculosis infection. It's important to note in a lumbar puncture and CSF analysis of someone with bacterial meningitis that you may get a negative culture or a negative gram stain. Um, particularly in about 10 to 20% of cases. So it's by no means completely definitive, although the actual findings can be very helpful in directing you towards the cause. Blood cultures should also be positive, um, and you should consider doing a CT scan if you're worried about any signs of raised intracranial pressure, which may be apparent by the patient having an intolerance of light, having papilledema on foot endoscopy, having an altered mental state or focal neurological signs, and you should also perform a CT scan in patients who are immunocompromised. So the standard approach to the treatment of bacterial meningitis is empirical antibiotics before you know the actual organism and supportive treatment. In terms of the empirical antibiotics, generally a third generation keflosporin, which crosses the blood brain barrier quite easily with vancomycin is prescribed. Patients who are very young or old or who are immunocompromised are also added to get or also receive rather ampicillin. So that's Neisseria meningitis. Know some details about the bacteria itself and recognize the risk factors um, towards acquiring the illness. It's worth noting the use of selective and non-selective media and certain physical signs such as Koenig's and Brzezinski sign. Um, that might lead you to diagnosing it both in real life, but also in a clinical vignette. Recognize also the differences between bacterial, viral and TB meningitis on a CSF analysis and the indications for a CT scan as well. Hopefully you'll focus as well on the treatment of bacterial meningitis, which is supportive treatment and also empirical antibiotics, particularly those third generation keflosporins, which cross the blood brain barrier very easily with vancomycin and then ampicillin in the young and old and immunocompromised.